So, um, in terms of the port, what I was going to try to do is talk a bit about what's going on in the port today, um, touch on you know, some of the really important things that we see um, here and now, and then I'll talk a bit about what's coming up going forwards, if that's okay. I'm really, really proud of what happens in the port today in Southampton. Um, I do think it's a huge success story, and I think it's something that genuinely, as a city, we haven't done enough historically to talk about and promote. We are uh, the UK's biggest export port, uh, so over £40 billion pounds of stuff that we manufacture in the UK uh, leaves the port here every year, and over 90% of that goes outside the EU. Uh, and what I, I'm a, a simple, humble mechanical engineer, and I get really, really excited every day when the variety of manu manufactured stuff that arrives from all over the UK comes to our port to go and be sold around the world. Um, the reason it comes to our port is because we have this critical mass of activity, but also the location. We are the first port as you come into Europe, Northern Europe, on the, the main world routes, and the last port on the way out. So we're a great place to transship and to connect and pick up things. And because of that, if we have every month 11 shipping lines with 150 sailings to 54 ports in 41 countries. So we, if you like, are the Heathrow of the sea. So if you want to get your goods anywhere in the world, this is where you deliver them. And that includes many places in Germany, Northern Ireland, you name it, you ship it through here. If you're BMW in Germany, you will move thousands and thousands of cars every year from North America, where you make them, drop them off in Southampton, pick them up and deliver them to somewhere like South Africa or Australia. We are the hub for those manufacturers. And that's something which I think we don't make enough of. The connectivity we have both by sea but also by road is really important. And I think finally, as a, as a nation, we're realizing the importance of emissions and what we can do about that. And I'll come on to that in a moment. But as well as the export side of things, in terms of cruise, uh, we are the biggest cruise port in Northern Europe. Um, we have more than 5 million passengers a year that come through the port, if we include the Red Funnel ferries. And the reason I say that is when we talk to folk about transport and connectivity, yet we need to make sure we plan for the future in terms of rail and road, because a lot of people come and go through the port. But more than 2 million cruise passengers a year. And in terms of supply chain in the UK, um, we are a fundamental part of the supply chain of people like Honda in Swindon. So frankly, one of the prime reasons they're in Swindon is because they can get the goods which they bring in from the Far East into the UK at the port here, get them to Swindon, make a car and export them to North America before they'd even be manufactured if they're taking them to Germany or somewhere. And it's a real advantage we have, and that's one of the reasons why we have manufacturers locally to the port. Um, one of the real frustrations we have currently is that government policy directly at the moment is encouraging containers off rail and onto the road. And we're trying to reverse that because we think it's right to have more of a can on rail. Um, the sidings which we hope will be happening um, shortly, I know it's the, the council have to release some land which they're going through the motions of at the council's pace, but they need to release some land. That will add about 3% of the containers that are currently on road onto rail, we believe, and we hope that'll mean that there's, again, 3% fewer trucks or so on the road. Um, we're also looking at the best way um, and the options around charging vehicles. Um, we want to make sure that just with, just with say, plastic bags, you know, a five pence charge was enough to make us basically do all we possibly could to take our own old plastic bags back rather than use the free ones in the shop. And so with trucks, if there is a fairly small charge, if you have the choice of deploying a Euro 5 or a Euro 6, that's enough to make a difference. What we want to make sure is we're not charging so much that actually we simply lose so much business to other places that actually we start to close parts of the port down. Um, we want to make sure the data that's in use is good. I know that Liz and her team have demonstrated that some of the council's data is interesting. Um, I think we've also demonstrated the same. So we're trying to make sure that you know, we're working on good information and we can move things forward. But we also are keen to avoid what I call unintended consequences when it comes to uh, your air quality. And let's make sure that if we can, we can improve things whilst making sure that actually we still have jobs and that sort of thing. And there's a balance in that. It, it's, it's really important, I think, that it's, it's understood that we are, we are very keen to make it clear that you know, we know that the air quality locally is getting better, it's getting better all the time. 
we want to make sure that it continues to get better and I think the question is how quickly we can best make it better for everyone rather than just debating about particular points in time. It has been improving, it will improve. The question is what's the best thing to make it better for everyone. And as many of you will know, um, a few years ago we were excited about ozone, then we were excited about carbon dioxide. Uh, I think the current flavour I guess is NOx. Particulate matter is frankly a real, real important one to get into. Um, and I think as a nation, rather than focus on any one thing, we need to understand how we make the totality work better together. There's a piece around policy for the, for the UK around that, but we're trying to make sure that we do the things that we can to move things forward. So you know, we have put in place our own um, air quality strategy, and if anyone's interested, I've got some copies with me today. Um, but we have a whole lot of monitoring in place on the port now, um, so we know what the story is in terms of a whole load of different emissions factors within the port and we're happy with where things are and we want to keep on improving it but we are looking at how we have different tariffs for different ships to encourage envir more environmentally friendly, friendly ships to come to the port within the port we are very rapidly moving to port vehicles being either electric or euro 6 only um, we now have ships coming to port uh, so the newest if we think about the the ship the german ship that comes in every monday or tuesday um, she has about three and a half thousand passengers. She's significantly bigger than the QM2, the Queen Mary II, and she uses less than half the power in port the QM2 uses because she is newer and the technology behind what makes her run is so much more efficient. But also when she's in port, she runs on liquid natural gas, not on diesel. And so in terms of NOx and so on, it's a much, much better story. Um, we did some master planning in 2005 2009 and we revisited it um, in the last year or so. I'll just give you one line to give a flavour of how we see things changing. So in terms of the cruise line activity, um, we had in 2005 700,000 cruise passengers who came through the port. We thought in 2009 that in 2030 we'd have 1.9 million passengers. So the number we thought we'd have in 2030 was 1.9 million. We actually went past 2 million in 2017, and we now think there is the demand for about 3.5 million cruise passengers in 2035. Now, that makes an assumption that the capacity is there, and clearly that's an assumption which is very, very much um, a debatable one. But the demand inherently is there, and the question for us is to what degree should we try to meet that demand to frankly bring both the benefit that comes with that, whether it's for what cruise brings, whether it's to help the manufacturers for automotive products get the product abroad, or whether it's to help the container business grow and so on. Signed up. Um, 2016, uh, when I arrived in the port, uh, many of you will know much more about the port and its history uh, than me, but in 2016, the biggest in the world, uh, 16,000 TEU, that was pretty big. And I thought, surely they can't get much bigger. Or well, 2017, 20,000 TEU, and sorry, um, jargon in case you don't know, a TEU, um, these big container ships, everything is measured in TEUs, which are 20 foot equivalent units. So a big container is two TEU, it's 40 foot, and a small container is one TEU. So that will take 20,000 TEU, 2017. This year, uh, we're up to 20,600. And just for information, um, uh, if that ship went past the is the Harry Truman, whatever the Nimitz class carrier is that currently off um, Portsmouth. Um, that's more than twice the size in volume terms than the Nimitz class carrier from the States. Now with containers, it's worthwhile pointing out, uh, in the container port, um, ironically, there are some real technology issues right now in Felixstowe. Uh, they have put in a new computer system, which doesn't quite work as well as they'd like it to. So lots and lots of ships have either had to miss Felixstowe, been held up, knock off the containers they want, and loads and loads of issues in Felixstowe. And what that's meant is that uh, we are particularly busy right now with containers. So you may well see container stacks higher than you've seen them possibly ever. You may see containers where you wouldn't normally see them in the port, empty ones, and that's simply because Felixstowe's having some difficulties, so we are trying to help take up some of the slack. The Christmas peak that goes on in September anyway adds to that problem, so it's a really quite frantic time. Um, so there will be uh, more activity now than there normally is, in particular 
activity taking place on Sundays and certain times of night that wouldn't normally happen. Now, we do know that's going on. Um, if you have any particular issues with that, you know, the fact that we know it's happening, we still want to do what we can to mitigate it. And DP World specifically on their website is saying, you know, please let us know and we'll do what we can to mitigate it. Because we do know that's an issue right now. It will die down very quickly in terms of the current activity. Once the Christmas peak is over, I would suggest in about four to six weeks time. What we are doing right now is we believe that the containers that we have will stay, that the activity of the ships will stay within the current container terminal. And all we are looking at is as, as the ships get bigger, making sure that we can actually take them within that terminal going forward. We can now, and what to make sure we, we still can in the future. So the container piece, it's busy, it's very busy right now, but again, there are only three ports in the UK that can take the larger ships in the world, and we are one of them. Um, in Ocean Dock, um, a, a fairly modest uh, passenger ship alongside a car ship. Um, when we have a large passenger ship in, it's too big to have another ship alongside. Um, the challenge we have is that we are not only having more calls, but as you might have noticed, the cruise ships, like the container ships, are getting rather larger. And in terms of the numbers of calls we have in the port, in the last 10 years, so from 2007 to, to 17, the number of calls doubled. So we went from about 250 cruise ship calls to just over 500 calls last year. So double the calls over that 10 years. I think going forward we'll see some growth, but it'll tail off in terms of numbers of calls. The challenge we'll see though is the size of ships. At the moment, there's a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of dark blue up here. 3% of the cruise ships in the world today have more than 4,000 beds. Of the ships on order now, so over 100 cruise ships are currently on order, that means that globally, by 2026, half of the world's cruise ships will have more than 4,000 beds. So they're getting quite large. Um, now the irony, of course, is these ships that are being built are increasingly built, powered by LNG. They're increasingly operating with far more LNG equipment and so on. So they're actually far more efficient than the ships perhaps they're replacing. But the challenge for us is we're going to see potentially more and larger ships. And therefore the piece we're working with the cruise lines on is how do we make sure that we maximize the number of passengers that come and go from the port by coach or by train or that sort of thing to make sure that we can handle that going forwards. Um, another unintended uh, challenge of larger ships. Um, this is a facetious question. This is a hole in the ground, obviously. Um, it's around about 20 meters across, around about eight or nine meters deep. And that hole in the ground is a hole in the eastern dock, which when it was filled in, um, all it had was one little bollard. So as the ships get larger, as you can imagine, when the wind blows, um, they want to blow off the berth sometimes. And so you've got to hold on to them pretty tight. As the ships get really, really big, they're like a very large sail, and you've got to hold on really tight to them. So for the new, and that was the hold for one bollard of 150, 150-ton racing. For the new P&O ship, which is in construction now, Iona, um, based in the port, um, launches in April 2020. Uh, we are taking the ocean terminal out of service at the end of October this year, and we'll be putting in basically 24 of those 150 ton bollards just to hold on to that ship in strong winds. So it's a very, very large undertaking, but we've got to make sure we hold on to them because when the wind blows, you don't want them blowing across the dock if you can help it. So, um, big ships have all sorts of problems, some of which you know about, some of which you don't. Um, there's an absolute star called Andrew who works at DP World, um, and he loves taking uh, pictures. Uh, this is a picture taken from DP World of a day when we had five cruise ships on their way in with the uh, uh, yachts in March on the way. But it's a, uh, a lot of nice pictures around. The port is quite a busy place, uh, by which I mean in the eastern dock, it's quite challenging when we have at the same time a number of car ships mixing with passenger ships and grain activity and so on. And when you start then having some of the car trains arriving at the same time, it gets really quite congested. So the challenge for us as we go forward is if we are going to try to meet some of the growing demand, we want to make sure we can do it in a way that gives better service 
and actually reducing some of the congestion or reducing some of the emissions locally and so on. So we're trying to understand what the options are for that. Meanwhile, with the automotive product, we have been building more and more car parks for storing export product. We've just announced another 3,000 space car park that we're starting to build right now. That opens in, uh, that opens in, well, the first phase is 29th of March next year. Funny that, might need some space in March. Uh, but with the growth that we're having, what we are doing at the moment is we're trying to understand what the long-term options are for the port. We know we have the Eastern Dock, which was basically built by the Victorians, the Western Dock, roughly in the 1930s into the 40s, the Western Dock extension, built through the 60s, final bit, I think, in the 80s at Quayside. And we know that across uh, the way, across the water side, is the reclaim, the land that was reclaimed as part of the main dredge in the 60s and 70s and into the early 80s. And the question for us is, in the long term, what should we be trying to do and what might we try to do? We haven't got the answers yet. What we're very clear on is if something was going to happen across the water, ever, I really want to make sure that we don't have piecemeal development. I want to make sure that it's properly considered and thought through. So we're saying, well, over the next, let's say the next 50 years, it is highly likely that um, at the power station uh, down at Forley, there will be plans for development. I know they're planning up now, so what will happen at Forley over the next 50 years? Uh, the Exxon facility, uh, they have already planned some very large investment they're looking to do there in the next few years. So we want to see what, what, how will that develop? We know that um, Solink Gateway, that's the, uh, the march with military port, they have a number of plans for what they might do one day. We have, as we say, a land holding, which we need to understand what the options might be one day. But also Barker Mill have various bits of land. So we're doing work, and have been for the last year, with Hampshire County Council, with New Forest District Council, with the National Park Authority, and the various landowners to say, well, if, if there was going to be development of some sort in the next 50 years, what should we do to make sure it's properly planned and thought through so that actually we have transport infrastructure, we have environmental gain, and so on. What might that look like? So that's a piece of work we're working through for the last year or so, and my expectation is we'll see more of that over the next year or two as we start to bring that to life. So we're trying to think for the long term, what might this look like? Because if we're going to do something, I want to make sure it's properly thought through uh, for everyone's benefit, if we can.